This is the unrequited love of a poet, and it's a true story. I first learned what a stalker is when I'm a freshman at the University of Georgia in 1982. A girl named Ginny, who lives across the dormitory hall from me, she has a stalker. He's a handsome, clean-cut business major. She finds out he's secretly taken pictures of her after he shows her an entire album filled with photos of her standing at the bus stop, eating lunch on a bench, and walking out of the ladies' room at the campus student center. He calls her at all hours from a payphone below her dorm room, shows up at her South Campus classes with roses, and sends her gifts of lacy underwear. <laughs> Some of the girls on our dorm floor gush about what a sweet, attentive boy he is, <laughs> and really, how could someone so good-looking be so bad? Ginny is terrified, especially after he grabs her at the library, begging to take pictures of her in the nude. The campus police suggest she move, and for the time being, never walk anywhere alone. After being escorted by friends everywhere for the rest of the school year, Ginny finally shakes her stalker when she moves off campus. Three years later, I'm living off campus with my younger sister Shannon in a two-room apartment in an old converted southern house in the Five Points area of Athens. We're both going to the University of Georgia. I'm 21 and working at Steve Arino's Pizza, which is only a half a block from our apartment. One evening, a guy comes into Steve Arino's and I take his food order. He seems shy as he leans on a table waiting for his to-go pizza. He watches me wait on other customers and a few minutes later when there's no one in line he ambles up and leans on the counter his head down as if he wants to tell me a secret you like poetry he asks yeah your pizza will be ready in a few minutes i tell him i'm a poet you like poetry he repeats I heard him the first time, but since I don't like poetry, I decide I'll be polite and just answer the pizza-related question he never asked. He lifts his head, smoothing back his thick brown hair. He's almost handsome, but older, maybe in his 30s. You like poems? Uh, no, not really. Why not? I don't know, my dad's a poet and I always hated his stuff. Maybe I could change your mind. Maybe I could read my poems to you sometime. I'm kind of busy, I reply as I vigorously wipe down the counter with a beer-soaked rag. He keeps grinning at me like he's trying to break my will with his smile. He seems to be a townie, not a student. He certainly doesn't look like a poet. Maybe he's using this poetry as a ruse, like those guys who invite women to look at their etchings. <laughs> Come on, I bet you like my poems. Well, I don't know. I'm starting to cave and I hate myself for my weakness. I've never been good at turning guys down, no matter what. I always hope there will be an earthquake or a gas explosion before I have to give them an answer. I'd prefer to choose potential death for us both and anyone near us to avoid hurting their feelings. But with my luck, we'd be the only two survivors of the explosion, and though we'd stand there with blackened faces and singed eyebrows, he'd start up again with, so you want to read my poetry? Followed by my, well, I'm real busy this week. Then he'd ask me, how about next week? <laughs> Unfortunately, in reality, no disaster, natural or otherwise, finds its way to Steve Arino's pizzeria tonight. So, what's your name? Um, I sigh. Corey. So, Corey, what do you say? Just give me your number and I'll read my poems to you. Well, I stall. Listen, just write your number on this napkin. Order up, 
My manager, Randy, yells from the back. I turn to Randy, smile, and mouth the words, thank you. <laughs> then say to the man, oh, look, your pizza's ready. Then he does the worst thing to me. He pulls out a crumpled dollar bill and shoves it across the counter. For you, Corey. By the way, my name's Ed. I look at the dollar and the napkin next to it. Jeez, my phone number for a buck. Part of me is screaming inside as I envision Ed spontaneously combusting into flames while I yell at him for just not getting it. But I don't want to give him my number. Instead, I don't even touch the dollar as I slowly pull a pen out of the coffee can near the cash register, hoping it'll be out of ink. Of course it isn't, but I'm still holding out for a lightning strike or maybe an out of control Mack truck ramming through the restaurant, killing everyone, including Ed and me. I try to make my phone number as illegible as possible. Ed picks up the napkin and reads it back perfectly to me. <laughs> Corey, I'll call ya. Maybe next week. Have a good night. Put that dollar away now before someone else swipes it. All I can think is hopefully we're due for a good tornado by next week. <laughs> Ed's head is up now, cheerful as he grabs his pepperoni pizza and goes out the front screen door. I look at the dollar just sitting there, soaking up 99 cent Miller Lite, and I watch my hand slowly pick it up and stuff it into my jeans pocket. A few days later, I come home from classes and see the red light on my answering machine blinking. I press it and hear, hey, Corey, it's Ed, you know, the poet. Just wanted to know what your father's up to. Does he know where you are? What? I say to the machine. I rewind it, then replay the message. My sister Shannon comes home, listens to the message, and yells at me for giving out our number to some weirdo. Why did he say that about Dad, she asks. Well, I said Dad wrote poems, and that's why I don't like poetry. The guy told me he's a poet. Why didn't you just give him a fake number, Corey? This message is crazy. Don't call him back. Well, I wasn't planning on it, but he might come by again when I work on Friday. Friday morning, I'm sleeping on the floor of our bedroom. I get a strange feeling, so I peek one eye open and see someone at the window above me. I open my other eye, sit upright, and see Ed's face looking down at me and smiling. He runs off. Even though I'm in shorts and a t-shirt, I cover myself with my blanket and run towards the bathroom yelling, Shannon, he's out there. Her toothbrush is sticking out of her mouth when she says, who? That guy and the poet. Her eyes widen, where? In, in the bedroom window, he ran off, but he was looking at me. We both run to the kitchen, look through all the windows and see nothing. I make sure the tiny latch on our mostly glass front door is locked. And then I turn around realizing our entire two-room apartment is almost all windows with no curtains. As if years ago they used this part of the big old home as a greenhouse. Shannon spits out her toothpaste into the kitchen sink. Great, Corey. Look what happened because you gave our num gave him our phone number. But how do he find out where I live? I don't know. But if he comes back, we gotta call the police. Later that day, I worked the lunch shift at Steve Arino's with Melinda, the day manager. She's a big gal, a no-nonsense 32-year-old townie. Melinda isn't pretty, but everyone loves her personality and her flair for cursing. One thing about Melinda, though, despite her Georgia upbringing, she's obsessed with anything to do with New York City. She claims this all started 10 years ago when she worked with two guys from the Big Apple. She loved that they didn't take shit from all these Georgia rednecks, and they referred to everyone as bastards and sons of bitches. While Melinda is taking a delivery order on the phone, Ed walks in. 
strides right up to me at the counter to order lunch like he wasn't peeking through my window just a few hours before. <laughs> I'm shaking as I grab a pen and ask, why were you outside my bedroom window this morning? He squints at me, shakes his head. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. I saw you before you ran away. He continues to shake his head. Couldn't have been me, Corey. I was at work. Guess what? I got something for you today. I grip the pen. Just tell me what you want for lunch. Okay. Ed says as he scratches his brown hair and looks up at the menu printed on the wall behind me. I guess I'll have the Steve Reno sub sandwich to go and an iced tea. I'll take the iced tea now. I rip his order off the pad and shove a plastic tumbler of tea at him. Melinda gets off the phone and asks, who's, who's, the, who's your friend there? He's not my friend. He's some guy who wants to read his poetry to me, but I saw him outside my bedroom window this morning. I think he's kind of weird. <laughs> no shit, she says. Look at him spilling his tea. Son of a bitch. I turn around as she yells, hey, you, stop slopping your damn tea on the floor. Ed's hands are shaking so badly his tea is splashing onto the red tiles. Melinda throws napkins at him. Here, next time get a to-go cup with a lid, fool. Ed just drops the napkins to the floor and presses them down with his old sneakers. Melinda leans over the counter. Hey, don't think I'm picking up after you. Throw it in the trash can, you hear me? She turns to me. I swear. We get all the crazies at lunch. And you want to know why? Because they can't hold down a job like normal people, so they come in here and give me a mess of trouble. Um, but he says he was working this morning. Yeah, right. That son of a bitch doesn't look like he could figure out which end of the broom sweeps up the dirt. <laughs> Ed finishes his iced tea, throws out the napkins, then picks up his to-go sub sandwich. This is for you, he says, as he pushes a small piece of paper towards me, then plops his plastic iced tea tumbler on top of it. He wheels around and out the door. Melinda comes over. Hey, what the bastard leave ya? I don't know, maybe a poem. Did I tell you he's a poet? Well, shit, maybe that's what he does for a living. Only weirdos can write that crap. <laughs> well, pick it up. It ain't gonna bite you. I push the tumbler off it and unfold it. It's a check for $25,000. <laughs> There's a name on top, Edward Merchant, but no address. Shit, Melinda shouts. Let's call the bank and find out if, find out if it's real. Then we can cash it. She dials the number for Citizens in Southern. She ends the phone call with a guffaw, so I think it means we're rich. Shit, Corey, son of a bitch, ain't got had an account for over a year. We take the generous bad check and tack it onto our bulletin board with all the do not deliver to this address notices. <laughs> I get home and there's a new message on my machine from Ed. Corey, I'm still waiting. Where's your father? I erase it before Shannon gets home. We try putting sheets up on our windows, but they keep falling down, so we give up. Shannon's getting more angry about this situation and has threatened to move in with her friend Kathy across town. The next morning, I wake up with that feeling of dread. Ed's at my bedroom window again. I scream, I see you! He runs off laughing. I'm angry now. I practically break my index finger as I jam it on the 911 buttons on our phone. The police tell me they can't do anything unless he threatens me. They recommend that I move in with a male friend. Then they suggest Ed'll probably stop when he gets bored. But that's the thing, I think. Crazy people don't get bored. <laughs> Ed continues to come back to Steve Arino several times a night, giving me pictures he cut out of bridal magazines. <laughs> then he sits, his hands shaking, waiting for his to-go order. My manager, my night manager, Randy, tells me that I can stay in the back by the pizza oven when Ed comes in and he'll take his order. Then, 
Randy has our delivery guy run across the parking lot to another pizza restaurant called Sons of Italy and get one of their to-go menus. When Randy gives Ed his sub sandwich, he tells him, why don't you try getting your food from Sons of Italy next door? Ed looks at the menu, then squints at me as I peek out near the pizza oven. He lets the Sons of Italy menu fall to the floor, laughs, and walks out the door. Shannon tells me she's moving in with her friend Kathy over on Grady Avenue. We decide to break our lease. I have nowhere to go, so I move into the apartment right next door to us with my friend Alan. He's delighted I have a stalker. <laughs> Turns out, despite his short, chubby, bespectacled appearance, Alan reads Soldier of Fortune magazine. <laughs> now, maybe he has a chance to use some of the weapons he's been collecting. <laughs> Alan pushes up his thick glasses and assures me, I I'll take care of anybody who comes near you, Corey. And then he sniffles and wipes under his nose, don't worry. I think if he ever does battle with Ed, he'll have to keep one hand free to push up his glasses and wipe under his nose. <laughs> I pack up all my stuff in my garbage bags and move into Alan's tiny utilitarian apartment. If Shannon's and my apartment had been the greenhouse part of this old house, Alan's looks like it might have been the original back hallway. <laughs> it's a good thing I know Alan's a genuinely nice guy because every night when I lie down on his floor, he carefully places various knives around my blanket. <laughs> He keeps a few by his own mattress on the floor two feet away. A week later, I'm alone as I look out the window of Alan's apartment. I see a man with a familiar gait walking down my street. His hair is bleached blonde and as he gets closer, closer he seems to be talking to himself. Then I realize it's Ed. I duck and wait until I think he's passed by Alan's apartment. Twenty minutes later, I peek out and run a half a block to work. Somehow, despite his new hair color, I'm really hoping everything will calm down with Ed. I haven't seen him at Steve Arenas the last few days I've worked, and if he looked into my old bedroom window, he'd realize I'm gone. A few days later, on a Thursday night, during the dinner rush, Ed shows up at Steve Arenas. This time, he's changed his appearance again. He's still bleached blonde, but now he's shaved both sides of his head into a mohawk. <laughs> Even in a college town full of punk rocker kids, this older guy walking around like this is unnerving. I stand back by the pizza oven looking out at, as Randy, all businesslike, takes Ed's order. When Ed gets his change back, his hands don't shake. He stands there glaring at me as his tongue runs over his gums. Randy tells the pizza cook to put Ed's order in ahead of everyone else's. I guess a man with a mohawk glaring, waiting for his pizza in the middle of the restaurant is bad for business. <laughs> the cheese barely melts on the small pepperoni pizza before the cook pulls it out, puts it in a box, and slices it. From my perch by the pizza oven, I peek out, and along with fellow workers, watch Mohawk Ed grab the pizza box right out of Randy's hands. He gives me one last look, then turns on his heel. Instead of carrying the box horizontally, like most people, he turns the box on his side vertically under his arm, and he's swinging it back and forth as he storms out the front screen door. Randy turns to us and huffs. How do you like that? Never even said thank you. How rude can you get? All night long, me and my fellow workers have a good laugh about Ed carrying his pizza under his arm. We get an empty pizza box and do impersonations of Ed and how he stalked out of the restaurant like his pants were on fire. We even pretend to be Randy saying, how rude, didn't even say thank you. The next day, I show up for the Friday lunch shift, all ready to treat Melinda to my impersonations of both Ed and Randy from the night before. Instead, when I walk in, she greets me with, did you hear what that son of a bitch poet did last night? Yeah, he came in with his head shaved in a mohawk, and then he grabbed his pizza and walked out with the pizza under his arm, you know, like how you carry your school books? 
Melinda's hand goes over her mouth. Shit, no. You know what that bastard did last night? Shot the clerk at the Golden Pantry next door. Oh my God, I, I cry. Is he okay? Yeah, he just grazed him a bit. Cops came by this morning asking if I knew anything. Told him that son of a bitch kept coming in here and bothering you. Don't worry, they picked the bastard up last night. Shit, you're damn lucky. Could have been you. Wow, I, I am lucky, I, I say, shaking my head. I thought poets were crazy, but I never thought they could be dangerous. Boy, I really hate poetry now. <laughs> Shit. You know who that son of a bitch reminds me of, Melinda says as she ties her apron on? That New York City taxi driver in that movie, you know, you talking to me? You talking to me? She throws an order pad at me and laughs. Tell you what. Next time some poet comes in here, you send that son of a bitch over to me. I'll kick his butt right over to the parking lot to Sons of Italy pizza right next door. <laughs> the following day, the police come by and talk to me at work. Turns out Ed lived right down the street from me. Neighbors claim he'd been writing poems for years and has suffered from mental problems. The police told me they brought Ed to a psychiatric ward. After they leave, I wonder, did my rejection set Ed off? I decide from now on, if any guy comes into Steve Arenos and tells me he's a poet, I'll say, wow, you know who loves poems? Melinda. <laughs> Lay some heavy stuff on her and she'll tell you exactly how much she likes poetry. Thank you. Yeah.